Hello, welcome back to Undergraduate Seminar, everyone. I'm very excited to introduce Kevin Santos, a previous speaker who's going to tell us about modeling mathematics with knitting and crochet. Uh, I love geometry. I'm super curious to hear about this. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks for everybody who came here. And thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, so as the title says today, I'll be talking about modeling math with the yarn work crafts of knitting and crochet. Um, before I get into it, uh, just feel free to, um, if you have any questions or if you want to correct something of a mistake I made, um, feel free to type it in the chat. I'll have the chat open and uh, or you can also interject with your mic if you wish. Um, so to start, I want to explain a little bit about my experience with these uh, these crafts so far. Um, so actually last semester, I had the pleasure of taking Math DO2, um, Classical Plane Geometries and Their Transformations with uh, Professor Shabazi. And I uh, would recommend taking that course. It's very interesting. And especially last semester, um, we had um, a lot of guest speakers from different um, areas and parts of the world who um, linked together or connected um, the geometrical concepts we we're learning about to other um, interesting concepts. And one of them, one of the speakers we had was Professor um, Dinah Taimina from uh, Cornell University. And um, she was actually the first person who uh, conceived of making a model of the hyperbolic plane using um, crochet. And uh, one of the assignments for that class was we could um, choose to construct a model of hyperbolic plane using either crochet or paper. Um, and I chose to, without any prior knowledge of crochet, I chose to make a model with crochet. And I taught myself how, and it was a little bit difficult at first, but I managed to make my own model. Wow. And uh, that got me really interested in learning more about this. So uh, let me just get into it. So, um, right, crocheting the hyperbolic plane. Um, so I'm just going to start by talking about geometry first. Um, Euclidean, the geometry that most people learn in high school is known as Euclidean geometry. And it's geometry in the flat plane. Um, and it's the most natural or intuitive uh, idea of geometry that we tend to have. Um, but this geometry is actually based on a set of five axioms or postulates that were originally established by Euclid a long, long time ago. Um, and he described, uh, he used these axioms and postulates to describe the behavior of uh, lines and points as we want them to behave. Um, and the first four are pretty straightforward. I don't really need to get into the details, um, but the fifth one is the most contentious. Um, and uh, it's a lot of mathematicians were unsure of how it fit in with the rest of the axioms. Um, and it's called the parallel postulate. So um, I'll explain what that is right now. The parallel postulate says that given a line L and a point P outside of the line, there is a unique line that passes through P and is parallel to L. Um, so to draw a picture of that, so say we're given a line L and a point P outside of L. Um, there, in Euclidean geometry, there is a unique line that passes through P and that is parallel to L that will never intersect the original line. Um, and given that the other axioms are basically just about drawing lines and circles, this one seemed a lot more complicated. And mathematicians struggled with this for a while, trying to figure out, well, is this postulate needed? Is it necessary? Can it actually be derived from the other axioms? Um, and are there other ways of formulating it so that the geometry is still consistent? Um, uh, but, other mathematicians thought about 
well, what happens if we try to replace this fifth axiom with um, a different, a different uh, version of it? And that led to the axiomatic and theoretical uh, conception of um, non-Euclidean geometries, including spherical and hyperbolic geometry. Um, so is anybody like familiar with hyperbolic geometry at all? Like if you're familiar with it, uh, put a smiley face in the chat so that I can get a sense of like if anyone is familiar with it. Um, yes, thank you, Parker. Thank you, Logan. Yeah, uh, so it's good to know just so that um, in case um, anyone does know of it, uh, this should be a good refresher and um, I hope I can explain it well enough so that people who don't know about it can understand it better. Um, so hyperbolic geometry is what we get when we alter that fifth postulate so that um, we get something else. So <laughs> in hyperbolic geometry, instead of the original idea of the postulate, um, we have a straight line and a point P not on the line. There are at least two distinct straight lines through P that are parallel to L. So um, if you think about it like this, there are at least two lines um, through P that never end up intersecting L. Um, and that idea um, is definitely hard to understand, especially just seeing it as this, this postulate, this axiom by itself. Um, because uh, you may look at this, these two lines and say, well, if we send them, um, it looks like they'll meet um, eventually, but hyperbolic geometry is the geometry where we say, well, they actually don't end up meeting in the end. Um, and mathematicians uh, try to model the hyperbolic plane by giving alternate descriptions of what we want a straight line to be so that it fits this postulate. Um, so for example, the Beltrami model um, situates the hyperbolic plane in a circle and the, the lines in um, that we're talking about are just chords um, connecting two points on the circumference of the circle. Um, and you can see how even if we have this model, this geometric model of the hyperbolic plane, it's still not super intuitive because um, in this picture, for example, all these triangles are actually congruent. They're all the same size, except since we're trying to fit the infinite hyperbolic plane into this finite circle, um, that ends up making the areas and the angles kind of distorted. So um, this model can be helpful in some ways, but it's not the most intuitive either. Um, but let's think a bit more about what it means to have a model of a geometry. So um, we tend to think of Euclidean geometry as sort of living in a flat plane. Like if we draw a sheet of paper, we can draw straight lines, we can draw triangles, you can draw angles. Um, and they all sort of live in this flat surface. But is there a kind of surface that would have hyperbolic geometry on its surface um, that would, where the lines would interact in a way that is consistent with the hyperbolic axioms? Um, and Riemann actually proved that surfaces with constant negative curvature have local hyperbolic geometry. So that means that if you have a surface with constant negative curvature, then um, if you look at, um, if you zoom in on, onto the surface, we can see that um, lines and points behave as we expect them to in hyperbolic geometry. Um, and I will explain what it means for a, a surface to have constant negative curvature. But um, now the idea has shifted to if we can make a surface with constant negative curvature, then we'll have a model of the hyperbolic plane. So what does it mean for a surface to have negative curvature? Um, well, surfaces with positive curvature, they sort of tend to curve outward and eventually they close up like this um, soccer ball here. Um, 
and surfaces with zero curvature. They are flat, like just a flat sheet of paper. Um, and one way of visualizing these different types of curvature is to imagine tiling a surface with hexagons. So um, in the flat tiling, um, you can see how there are these six hexagons all surrounding um, a hexagon in the middle. And that arrangement makes hexagons want to lay flat. Um, but in this surface with positive curvature, we sort of tried to fit only five hexagons um, around a pentagon. So trying to fit five hexagons together um, so that they, uh, and then continuing this pattern, it um, results in a surface with positive curvature. So it eventually curves outward and closes up on itself. Um, so those are positive and negative curvature. Those are relatively easy to conceptualize. We have a flat, a flat plane and, um, and a sphere. Uh, but what about a surface with negative curvature? Now a surface with negative curvature, um, they sort of appear to fold into themselves and they sort of form ruffles and they curl up on themselves just like you know, the model that I made. They, they want to ruffle and curl. Um, and one way of seeing that and relating it to the other examples is if we have um, the hexagons, but we try to fit them, seven of them around a heptagon and try to continue that pattern, um, that results in a space in a surface with negative curvature um, because the, while the, um, the soccer ball, the original soccer ball wants to curve around and into itself, the, um, the surface with negative curvature, we try to fit seven hexagons, it sort of uh, fans out and curls out. Um, and unlike the sphere, um, the negative, the surface with negative curvature expands and can be extended indefinitely. Um, so you can continue tiling this crazy looking soccer ball uh, and if it'll, it'll become, um, it'll become a surface with negative curvature. Um, and as I previously said, this means that since we have a surface with negative curvature, um, the geometry, if we look at the geometry of it, um, roughly, it, it'll be a hyperbolic geometry on the surface. So um, this crazy looking surface uh, also has this weird geometry associated with it. Um, so how can we make a, a model of this, the surface with negative curvature and thus make a model of the hyperbolic plane? Well, um, William Thurston uh, was one of the first to develop a model of the hyperbolic plane using paper annuli, which are these um, parts of semicircles right here. Um, and taping them together um, and in this consistent pattern, and it eventually results in um, a model of the hyperbolic plane. Um, and this was actually the um, the model of the hyperbolic plane that uh, Professor Taimina used um, when she was learning about hyperbolic geometry. But um, this model, it was a bit fragile it, and it was hard to work with because it was made of paper. Um, so it, it wasn't the most suitable for uh, learning how to do geometry on its surface. Um, so she decided to use, um, try using crochet to produce a similar model. Um, and yeah, it, it, it does produce this really strange surface, um, but it, it becomes a little bit easier to work with when we use crochet. Um, so just to explain what crochet actually is, um, crochet is made, um, crochet fabric, begins with a series of loops. And um, we use the hook to sort of pass the loops through themselves. Um, and uh, to start off with, we always make a chain and that's just a chain of loops, um, the foundation chain, it's sometimes called. 
And um, then you use the hook to continue passing loops through the loops on the chain. And, um, and keep on forming rows in that way. Um, and just building on rows by pulling loops through loops and it's just a whole bunch of loops. Um, and the reason, the reasons why crochet is useful for this as I sort of alluded to earlier are it's sturdy, but it's still easy to manipulate. And um, crocheted fabric is worked by doing each individual stitch one at a time. And as we'll see, the number of stitches that we need to make for this plane um, grows exponentially. So it's, it's a bit easier um, if we can just do them one at a time. Um, unlike with knitting where you have to hold all of the loops at the same time uh, across a single row, um, crochet is a little bit more forgiving in that you can just go down each loop one by one. Um, so yeah, now let me explain how to actually make um, hyperbolic plane. So like with all crochet, crocheted fabric, we start with a row and add an increase in every nth stitch for some choice of n. So let's say, okay, so let's say this is the row. Um, and now we're just adding more loops to the original row. So let's say we choose n equals three. So then um, after doing one, two, three stitches normally, so pulling loops through loops and making three stitches normally, um, at the fourth stitch, um, you do another normal stitch, but then you increase by adding another stitch in the same loop as you just made a stitch in. So that's that's what it that's what we call an increase, and that just increases the number of, the number of loops in the next row, um, and then you just continue doing that. So do three stitches, and then um, in the fourth stitch. Um, you do two stitches in the same loop. And that again, increases the number of stitches in the row. Um, and then you keep on doing that until the end of the row. Um, and then you go back to the next, go back around to the next row and apply the same process. So do three loops, do an increase in the fourth loop, um, do three stitches, and then an increase in the fourth stitch and, uh, and so on. And it's a pretty straightforward construction. Um, but as you start making it, you'll see that as the number of stitches is growing, um, the surface starts to fan out and starts to curl on itself. And it makes that beautiful hyperbolic, hyperbolic structure that um, I talked about before. Um, so now you might be curious about what choosing different values of n might entail. Um, so choosing different values of n actually gives rise to hyperbolic planes with different radii. So sort of like how um, spheres can have different radii, um, hyperbolic planes can also have, these models can also have different radii. Um, and as you increase the, the value of n, as n becomes bigger and bigger, um, hyperbolic plane becomes flatter and flatter and it starts to close more closely approximate um, flat Euclidean space. Um, sort of like how um, on the surface of the earth, since the radius is so big, um, it looks flat from where we're standing. So choosing a huge, choosing a bigger value of n results in a flatter surface. Um, okay, so now I'll talk about actually doing geometry on this model. Um, so straight lines, just like how um, if we're if we're working with a flat sheet of paper, you can make a straight line just by folding it and making a crease. Um, we can also make straight lines on the crochet model just by folding it, um, and that's what we call a straight line in this model. And using these lines, we can visualize different properties of hyperbolic geometry, such as the hyperbolic parallel postulate, um, and uh, it, that thing that seems so abstract and, and strange, uh, the idea that there can be 
multiple lines parallel to a single line um, or multiple lines through a different point parallel to a single line, it suddenly becomes concrete in this model. So um, for a given line and a point, there are actually multiple lines that uh, pass through the point but never intersect the original line. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty cool how that weird um, that weird postulate suddenly becomes uh, materialized in this physical model. Um, and another aspect of the model or, and of the geometry that I can talk about are triangles. So um, triangles in the hyperbolic plane always have angle sum less than 180, um, pretty different from uh, triangles in the flat plane, since those always have 180 degrees um, if you add up the angles in the flat plane. If we have a hyperbolic triangle, the angle sum is always less than 180 degrees. And um, there are actually triangles in the hyperbolic plane with angle sum of zero degrees. Um, and these lines get, uh, this the angle between these lines gets closer and closer to zero. It asymptotically approaches zero. Um, and they, but they still do eventually meet at what we call a point at infinity. And um, that this type of triangle is called an ideal triangle um, since all the three, all the three points um, are points at infinity and the, the lines get asymptotically close to one another so that it has angle sum zero. And you can see this concrete representation of this abstract idea of an ideal triangle on the model just by folding the model and making um, a triangle. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool how um, this, uh, being able to crochet and make this model makes concrete and um, makes material the, the strangeness and the weirdness of hyperbolic geometry and allows you to gain more of an intuition about what exactly we're doing in hyperbolic geometry. Um, sort of like how we have an intuition of how things work on a flat plane, but um, being able to hold a physical model of the hyperbolic plane allows us to gain maybe not a perfect intuition, but uh, at least be able to better understand the, the weirdness, as we say in the chat, uh, the weirdness that is the hyperbolic plane. Um, All right, so are there any questions before I move on? I should probably pause because I've been talking kind of fast. Um, all right, so I'm going to um, pivot to something quite different. Can I ask a question? Oh yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> um, sorry, I, my mic was all bungled. Um, how do the straight lines work in the crocheted model? Like I, I see that they're kind of like threaded in there, but how do you know that those are the straight lines? Yeah, um, that is a little bit of a tough question. So it's sort of like, um, it, it would it would be getting a bit technical. I I think that it has something something to do with um, these lines are technically geodesics, which mm -hmm. are um, which can be thought of as like um, lines that minimize the distance between two points on the hyperbolic plane. Um, uh, sort of like um, like straight lines on the plane or yeah. great circles on a sphere or something. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So when you make that when you make that crocheted model, like I'm just thinking like, okay, maybe if on every nth stitch, every time I did that split, I should put the 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 straight line through that stitch or something. But here I it the 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 straight lines added onto the model don't look like they're going with the yeah. I don't know any crochet. I'm struggling for the words, but it, it is a little bit like um it's not it's not it's not perfect of course because it is we are we are working with like real objects with real thickness so um unfortunately we can't have an infinite infinitesimally infinitesimally 
thin piece of yarn. Um, and I'm sure if we can make, um, if we have like a thinner yarn, it might be a bit easier to thread together, thread, thread a line down the surface um, without it being bumpy. Um, but yeah, it, the folding and drawing the line with, with yarn is, uh, an approx is just an approximation of what a straight line would be. It's not, it's not quite perfect as we would like it to be, unfortunately. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Thanks for that one. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna pivot to something um, a little bit quite different, um, which is knitting and topology. Um, and even though these two things are kind of related, they are uh, pretty different and uh, knitting does offer certain properties and advantages that crochet um, that would, that are distinct from crochet. Um, so I actually, um, after I taught myself how to crochet, I decided to try teaching myself how to knit. Um, and um, it is a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more finicky in my opinion. Um, but I did find out that there has been a lot of work done with knitting mathematical objects, like um, certain topological topological objects that I will get into. So, um, before I start, is anybody here familiar with topology? So just put a smiley face in the chat if you have some experience with topology, so just so I can sort of gauge um, where people are at. <laughs> right, yeah. So um, uh, topology uh, is a subject where we're concerned with properties of spaces that are conserved under homeomorphisms. So um, a homeomorphism is sort of a continuous deformation of one thing to another. So, um, and uh, the example that's usually used is um, the fact that a torus or that's just the fancy word for um, a donut, is equivalent to a coffee mug. Um, and those two things are homeomorphic to each other because if you imagine that the torus is made up, made of this like extremely stretchy rubber material, um, we can sort of imagine molding it and deforming it to make uh, a coffee mug like this. And the, the hole that was in, in the donut becomes the hole in the handle of the mug. Um, uh, another example would be that we think of the, a circular disc as equivalent to a square, because you can sort of just imagine like pushing this disc sort of out and just molding it to make a square. Um, that doesn't, um, that is just a continuous deformation. We're not cutting or tearing it. We're just sort of molding it um, and deforming it. Um, so yeah, we can make it, if we can make a surface from another surface without cutting or tearing it and just deforming it, um, the two spaces are homeomorphic. Um, and we think of them as equivalent. So we don't care to distinguish between a disc and a square, like they're just the same. We think of them as the same. Um, so we're talking about knitting topological surfaces and there was a little bit of disagreement with the things that I was reading, because um, some books said that a surface, by definition, has no boundary, and some of them specified surfaces with and without boundary. But um, for my purposes, um, we're talking about smooth, compact, two manifolds, and we're talking about surfaces without a boundary. Um, so to translate that roughly into plain English, um, we're talking about surfaces which have which are two-dimensional mathematical objects that are finite, they don't extend infinitely, and um, they don't have edges or they don't pinch together at any point, they don't have any sharp corners. Um, and a two-manifold is just a fancy word for um, a space where every point has a neighborhood homeomorphic to R2. So if we look at a disk and look at the neighborhood around it, we can see that it just looks like a flat surface. Um, so we can think of these surfaces as being made from like, again, that stretchy rubber sheet that are just deformed and molded to make the surfaces that we want. Um, so 
what does it mean? The last thing is, what does it mean to have a surface without boundary? Um, so disks, a disk, an annulus, and a Mobius band, they all have um, a boundary, like the disk for the disk, the boundary is around um, the perimeter. The annulus has two boundaries, um, the inner and the outer one. And the Mobius band um, is a weird one because it looks like it should have two edges, but in fact, this edge continues all the way around and it only has one edge. It only has one boundary. Um, and if you don't know what a Mobius band is, it's just what we get if we take a strip of paper and just sort of twist, do a half twist before we um, tape together the two ends. Um, so it's just a sort of a cylinder, but with a half twist. Um, and that results in a surface with only one edge. Um, I have a crocheted, I crocheted one recently just to see if I could do it. And here's an example of one. There's a half twist um, and it only has one edge. Um, but we're talking about surfaces without boundary. Um, and the most common examples of those are uh, spheres and tori. Uh, see if I can draw a torus, um, aka a donut. Um, and you can see that these surfaces are kind of seamless. They don't have any edges. They're just sort of, they're just sort of perfectly um, together as one surface. Um, so how can we represent this sphere? Um, there are multiple ways of representing a sphere. Um, one way is to imagine you have, you take your sphere and you can sort of imagine cutting it along the equator, for example, and um, that results in the two hemispheres, which if you imagine just flattening out those two hemispheres, um, those are just two disks, right? And we can also make a sphere by identifying or sewing together these two edges um, of the two disks, and then you have a sphere. Um, alternatively, we can form a sphere by identifying the side of a two-sided polygon like this. So we have this two-sided polygon, and we're sort of bringing these two edges together and matching them up so that the, the orientations line up as indicated. And you can sort of imagine like bringing those two edges together and closing up the gap and making a nice sphere, um, and which is a sort of difficult way of thinking about it, um, but it'll come into play later. Um, but we can also apply a similar process by identifying the sides of a rectangle. So um, we can make a cylinder by just imagining you have like a paper strip and you just bring together, loop together the two sides and um, that gives a cylinder. Um, you just loop together the, the two sides and match them up. Um, and I, we identify these two sides according to this orientation and um, make a cylinder. Um, and the Mobius band can be constructed in a similar way where we just take um, a strip, but before we link together the two sides, we have to do a half twist and then, then the orientations will match as we want them to be. So I, um, after doing the half twist, okay, wait, I don't know if I can really draw that, um, but then the orientations will line up as we want them to, and then you can just stick them together um, to make a Mobius band. Um, okay, so this is where things get a little bit weird. Um, a torus can be thought of as a rectangle with the sides identified with each other as follows. So like before we can take, um, we have our cylinder, we can, we have the square and we're gonna identify the sides like this. Um, so again, like with the cylinder, we're gonna link together, we're gonna tape together these two sides. Um, and then, then we have a cylinder. And then after that, we can bring together, bend the cylinder and stretch it out so that the two boundary circles match up. And then we have the torus. Um, so just bending up, bending out this 
the cylinder and matching up the two sides. Um, of course, maintaining this orientation or how we want the sides to end up lining up. Um, and then just glue along that and then imagine that there's no seam there and um, that makes a torus. Um, okay, and this is also a really weird one. So um, what if uh, instead of, um, so in this, in the original torus, right? Um, the two, the two sides, these two sides labeled B, um, they, they match up, um, they have the same orientation uh, in the original diagram, but um, what if we somehow try to twist, introduce a twist into, into the construction? So again, we want to um, glue together these two sides, that doesn't change, but um, somehow, we have to twist this cylinder so that somehow we're, so that uh, this orientation will be reversed and then match up together this, the boundary circles at the end um, so that the orientations will match um, as indicated in the original diagram. Um, so in order to do that, you actually have to make the surface pass through itself. Um, in this diagram, they describe it as pushing a disk into the future by entering the fourth dimension and making the surface pass through itself. Um, because, um, <laughs> yeah, it was it is a little bit of a weird line, but um, it's another way of saying the fourth dimension. Um, because in 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 a faithful representation of the Klein bottle, it doesn't actually pass through itself. Um, it's only when we have to represent it in three dimensions that um, it ends up passing through its own, the cylinder, uh, the wall of the cylinder passes through itself. Um, but we need the fourth dimension to make it pass through itself. And um, then we have the famous Klein bottle. Um, so you can see how just identifying the, sorry, the, the size of a rectangle in certain ways can give rise to these different um, surfaces. Um, and it turns out that any topological surface without boundary can be, represent, can be represented by identifying pairs of edges in a polygon with an even number of sides. So you, you can just take, yeah, we can make any topo, topological surface we want um, by taking a polygon and identifying pairs of opposite sides in different ways and orientations. Um, so for example, a two-hole torus can be represented as an octagon by identifying opposite sides. I don't quite know if this is right, but you get the idea. And then um, I'm not 100% sure about the um, orientations, but it eventually will result in a two-hole torus or something that's homeomorphic to a two-hole torus. Um, so yeah, we can, the gist of it is that we can make, we can represent a topo topological service by like identifying the sides of a polygon. Um, and uh, it might not, it might be difficult to, to visualize and it might be difficult to understand and wrap your head around it but it does create a topological surface that maybe it exists in four dimensions, um, which is when you have n dimensions and you let n equals four, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, uh, so that leads me to another theorem, um, which is about classifying these surfaces without boundary in a different way. Um, so it turns out that, um, any path connected surface without boundary is homeomorphic to um, a sphere, a connected sum of n tori, or a connected sum of n projective planes. Um, and path connected just means that um, it's sort of just like all of one piece. So um, any point on the surface can be connected to another point on the surface via a straight, via a line. Um, uh, so 
any path connected surface, sur any path connected surface without boundary um, can be represented as a sphere. The connected sum of n toruses, so um, sum for some n, and the connected sum or the connected sum of n projective planes. And I'll explain what I mean by connected sum and n projective, n projective planes in a second. Um, so when we take the connected sum of two surfaces, that just means that um, you remove a disk um, on the interior of both of those surface, surfaces and then imagine sewing together the, the boundaries of those disks to make a new surface. Um, sort of like how this, this sewing and or pasting idea is similar to how, like I said before, how we can sew or paste together the boundaries of two disks to make a um, to make a sphere, um, but um, in this case, we're sort of introducing the boundaries and connecting the two surfaces that way. So, connected sum of two toruses um, is not surprisingly a two-fold torus. Um, so that's what it means to take the connected sum. Um, and what is this? Productive plane. So any path connected surface without boundaries homo homeomorphic to the sphere. Um, we know what that is. Um, the connected sum of n tori. So you can just imagine a donut with n holes. Um, or um, the connected sum of n productive planes. But what is a productive plane? Well, I'll describe that right now. There are multiple ways of representing this projective plane topologically. So one of them is um, if we identify this, the sides of a two-sided polygon with a twist somehow, like instead of with a sphere where these two sides have the same orientation, um, these two sides end up, you have to twist them and match them up. And that ends up looking like it's called a sphere with a cross cap. Um, so that's one example of how to represent the projective plane. Um, another way of representing it is with this diagram um, where we identify the opposite sides of the rectangle um, by these orientations. And it looks like it might make sense for a second, but then after looking at it for a bit, it's really hard to visualize it. Um, it another way of saying it is that I, I believe that you can get the productive plane by taking a Mobius band um, and a disk and sewing them along the, the boundaries since they both only have one boundary, we can sew a disk to a Mobius band. And that is another way of describing the real projective plane. Um, but again, all of these are very esoteric and very abstract um, if you're not familiar with them. But there are ways of, um, there are ways of um, bringing the projective plane down to three dimensions. Um, and trying to represent it like that. So um, one of them is the Roman surface and the other one is Boy's surface. Um, and Claire Irving published um, knitting and crochet patterns for these representations of the projective plane in three dimensions. Um, so these are examples of um, non-orientable surfaces, which means that um, they, they are, uh, non-orientability is, is like another one of those strange abstract concepts. But um, for example, the, the Mobius band is non-orientable because it only has, um, it only has one side um, and you can travel along the one side from start to finish, um, but um, 
um, if if you sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to explain it because it is a little bit tough to explain. If you travel along the the um, the Mobius band and end up back where you started, your orientation actually gets reversed. Um, and uh, that is a very rough idea of non-orientability. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at explaining it. Um, but the idea, what I want to say about non-orientability is that when we want to represent a non-orientable non surface in three dimensions, it must either have um, intersect itself or um, uh, have singularities um, where the surface sort of like um, pinches in on itself. Like um, that's what it means to have a non-orientable surface. Um, all right. Oh, thank you, Parker. Um, hope you have a uh, good lecture. Um, and I just I do want to explain briefly how knitting works because um, it is a little bit different from crochet. Crochet. Um, so, like crochet knitting, fab knitted fabric is formed by passing rows of loops through each other. But unlike with crochet. Um, you start with a row of loops and those loops sort of, you cast them onto one needle and they sort of live on that needle um, and you use the other needle to um, pass loops through those live stitches that are on the needle. Um, so you cast on and you use the other needle to pass the loops through um, the loops already on the needle. And like crochet, knitted fabric can be shaped by increasing or decreasing the number of stitches in a row. And it's like a similar idea where we can sort of fit two stitches or two loops in one loop, or um, imagine combining together um, two loops in the previous in the previous row and just forming those into one one loop. Um, but knitting does have some advantages in constructing models, and um, for example. Uh, we can simulate the cutting and pasting of services um, by grafting knitted fabric. And there is a way of um, knitting together or grafting together knitted fabric so that the seam is invisible and you can't tell where the boundary is, um, which is perfect um, for topological surfaces because um, it best models the idea of not having boundary. Um, and yeah, so it is possible to graft together knitted fabric, sort of like um, how I was talking about grafting, grafting together the sides of um, a rectangle or grafting together, um, uh, yeah, grafting together the sides of a rectangle like that. Um, and like I said before about non-orientable surface, non-orientable surfaces, um, they, they, they either, have to intersect themselves or they have to um, have a boundary if we want to represent them in 3D space. Um, but as we're knitting, it is possible to create surfaces that pass through themselves by passing live stitches through knitted fabric um, and continuing knitting through the fabric. Um, and doing that, you can simulate non uh, self-intersection in for example, a non-orientable surface. Um, so knitting does have certain unique advantages. Um, and that is why um, uh, in Sarah Marie Bell Castro's 2009 paper, um, she describes how um, every topological surface can be knit. And um, she modeled it, uh, she modeled knitting topologically by representing knitted fabric as a long rectangle. And representing the rows um, by um, this long rectangle, where some of the sides uh, we are are identified with, with each other, to sort of simulate what 
what it means by um, uh, knitting a set of a series of rows. Um, so if we can represent knitting topologically by representing knitted fabric as this long, stretchy topological rectangle. Um, and then um, you can imagine making it or uh, making a diagram for knitting a topological surface just by um, uh, fitting or looping uh, a rectangle around um, a diagram, uh, as you can see in these um, pictures. So um, you can knit a sphere. We can make a schematic for knitting a sphere by um, imagining the knitting as you know a long um, rectangle that's looping around this diagram um, as in this picture. So um, when you get to the end of, when you pass through a side, you end up uh, at the other side where it's identified with in the same position. And you sort of continue doing that um, until you reach um, the top. So just wrapping this long topological rectangle around um, this diagram for knitting a sphere. Um, and the torus can be represented in the same way, um, where uh, we have that rectangle diagram that I talked about before. But um, we can start knitting and following the rectangle um, across and jumping to the jumping to the side that it is identified with um, when we reach an edge and just continuing in the same orientation um, and then continuing back up and through. Um, and then grafting together the beginning row with the last row. And that makes that whole process seamless. Um, okay. And yeah, so uh, Belkash's paper actually goes through a proof of knitting surface, knitting every kind of surface without boundary, including knitting orientable surfaces by, um, here's a general diagram for knitting orientable surfaces. Um, and um, as well as knitting non-orientable surfaces. Um, and here's a diagram, here's some diagrams for knitting non-orientable surfaces. Um, I don't have a lot of time, I don't have much time left to go over those, but just know that it, it is possible theoretically to knit uh, any topological surface without boundary. Um, and I just thought that was a cool, a cool thing to talk about because um, it, even though we can um, show that they can be knitted uh, using this topological model, um, it can, the difficult part might be in actually constructing uh, the knitted model, but I think it's a cool uh, way of thinking about knitting and showing how uh, the unique properties of knitting can actually uh, give insight into um, the construction of topological surfaces. Um, okay, so I don't have much time left, but I'm just, I just want to um, give a, a few more examples of yarn models. There's actually a lot of different applications that we can apply here, but um, we can also uh, make cipher surfaces out of yarn. Um, and um, I think that there will be a forthcoming talk in the, uh, in the seminar um, about cipher surfaces. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we can actually make them with knitting, which I think is cool. Um, and another cool example is the Lawrence manifold, um, which was uh, a crochet model was created using computer generated instructions. Um, and these um, represent the Lorenz equations, which describe chaotic systems. So if you're interested in differential equations and chaos and chaotic systems, um, that's a cool connection with crochet um, that people made. Okay, yes, I'm sorry, I did go a little bit over time, but um, I hope that I uh, managed to inspire you to uh, try out knitting or crochet yourself, maybe. And um, 
uh, I hope uh, that you found this interesting and maybe you learned something. Um, so yeah, here are my references. And um, if you want any further reading, um, I have a slide here. And I think this, these will be also be posted on the website. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you for listening. And um, yeah, thanks again to our organizers for having me. Thanks so much. Let's give uh, Kevin a round of applause. So I put in the chat a link to where you can give feedback on the talk. And I think we should do that before taking questions. So please use the link to give to give feedback.